1976. I was uh, quite young then, now. I think I was about 15 and a half to 16. I was identified as one of uh, the student leaders there, and I was uh, hunted down by police. But what really propelled me to leave the country was a day when I actually saw police shooting two twins aged between three and four years. They actually shot them, they were from a shop. They shot them dead. And that incident alone, the shooting of those kids, to me was unacceptable. I couldn't understand why the police could actually shoot kids like that, and it wasn't a mistake. It was a deliberate action, a deliberate murder on the side of the police. So I said to myself, uh, this is enough. Uh, I have to do uh, something in order to end this. I left the country in 1976, and about uh, July or so. Then I was in a number of countries abroad. When I came back in South Africa, mainly to further the aims and objectives of the African National Congress, uh, my task was to see to it that uh, comrades, when they get injured, uh, that is in the field, attend to them. So what really happened is this, that we were waiting for some people that we were supposed to train, and there was a police trap. They wanted me to surrender, and I couldn't surrender because I knew that I had a lot of information. I was shot with 13 pillars, various parts of my body. I did bleed a lot, and they left me there for more than an hour, and I was bleeding. I got interrogated that, from that very day, every day, every hour. It was at night when a police wanted to ask me some questions and I said to him, look, I'm tired now. I've been answering these questions ever since. And uh, he put the cigarette into my wounds. I was also put in a small ward or cell, you may call it, alone there. And there things began to happen again. It, it, it was really, uh, you know, uh, my real journey to hell. There, they, they applied a lot of torture, electrical appliances into my private parts, my genitals. They would put a, a wood sack on my head. They would try to suffocate me. They would actually uh, you know, slap me and do all those things. As they tortured me, I would try and cry and cry and cry until I couldn't cry anymore. They said to me things like, look, nobody knows where you are. The people that have seen you, they don't know who you are. Your colleagues know that you are dead. The only thing that could help you is to tell us. Just talk. Each time I hear footsteps, each time I hear jangling of keys, whenever I hear that, I was terrified because I knew that I was going to get some pain. I was a Christian at school, and in terms of sort of my preparedness to go into a war situation, really, and into a medical situation, Nothing around me prepared me for that. I was 17 years old when I went into the army. Nothing had prepared me for war, for, for seeing death. My first night there, helicopters came flying over and they started calling all doctors, please come to the hospital, all the medical personnel, everybody with this type of blood and so on. And found myself confronted with a patient way beyond anything I'd ever imagined was possible. Blood everywhere and body parts missing and so on, and uh, something which I had never been prepared for. I'd say on an average day, there was probably 10 people flown in from the Angolan situation into the hospital, maybe one or two of those dying and the rest of them very seriously injured. Um, and just seeing that over and over again did two things to you. One it made you really hard and just cut off your emotions but which was probably the thing which was probably even worse than that is that 
um, when there was a day where nothing happened, where it was a quiet day, you kind of got frustrated and bored. And if you had a quiet week, you almost wished that something would happen, because then at least you were living back on the adrenaline again. Nothing really got to me in terms of there and then where I was experiencing nightmares or anything, except one very real situation where a number of chaps who were actually up on a camp had driven over a landmine and the whole vehicle had caught a light. A number of them had lost limbs and had been sort of blown apart in that. Three of the guys managed to get out of the vehicle and sort of listened to the screams of the rest of their colleagues dying and burning to death and so on, who were trapped in their seat belts. The helicopters eventually got there, picked up the three survivors and brought them back to the hospital. One of them died on his way in. A second one, um, what, I knew he was going to die. He was, there was a couple of us working with him, trying to dress his wounds. He was burned from head to toe. Um, we're giving him morphine injections and so on, just trying to ease his pain. And uh, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a photograph of his girlfriend and he said to me, I'm really glad that I got injured because I'm going home to Pretoria and I'll be able to see her tomorrow and so on. And there was nothing I could really say to him to say, you're not going home because you're going to be dead in the next half an hour. And yet I wished I had said something. I wish I'd been able to, to tell him what was going to happen to him. And all I could do was kind of say, gee, she's pretty and, and just sort of be there with him. The, the, the other guy, we, we flew down to Pretoria, but two or three days later, he was dead. The next morning, well, that evening, I, I went back to my room and took those clothes off and sort of threw them in the corner. And the next morning, I was asked to be involved in doing the autopsies on, on the other guys who, who had been burnt. And um, we got them sort of all out on the table, and it was really a matter of trying to sort through the bits and pieces. Um, trying to work out which piece went with which, and it was completely impossible. They were burnt way beyond recognition. Um, and we had to just pack them into body bags that are appropriately and put them in coffins and just put a big label on to say, don't let the parents see. A number of weeks thereafter, the smell of that burnt flesh just hung in my room. And that caused me to have real nightmares, just to try and stop having those nightmares. I just kind of stopped myself from sleeping. In Robben Island, that situation itself was traumatic. In fact, I think I stayed in a single cell for about six months. That alone was, was torture. And it was on the instructions of the security branch that I should be actually treated that way. And in, in many ways, I was affected mentally. I was there alone, just alone. I couldn't go out because I was still injured. I was in a wheelchair. But there was a moment where I thought I was not sane, uh, where I thought that I was not able to talk. I was not allowed to read the Bible. The only thing, that written thing that was allowed in the cell was the toothpaste, and that was Colgate. And I remember there was a day, in fact, many, many times over, I would read aloud the words of the Colgate, C O L just to, to, to satisfy myself that I can still read, that I'm still sane. And some, sometimes uh, my hand was, still, this other hand was still uh, heavily bandaged. I would read my, this other hand, there's a one, two, three, and read them aloud so that I could just try to satisfy myself that I'm still sane, I'm not mad, that I can still you know, construct sentences and the like. The way that the team would work is we would pick up a track and we would just follow it and hunt the person like an animal that was at the end of that track until finally you caught up with them and shot them. And that in itself, the excitement of the kill, as it were, and the, the, the excitement of not knowing what was coming next, whether somebody was going to shoot at you around the next bush, could go on for two or three days. And one incident where it did go on for two or three days, and finally we did catch up with the guy. We found him hiding in a crawl. He wouldn't come out and we drove over it with a Casper, shot into the rubble and 
pulled this this guy out of, of that situation and of course he had holes in him and he had been driven over and so on and he was handed over to me to patch up. Um, at the same time it was discovered that he was a commander and so he was carrying uh, a pistol in a, a, and my unit commander desperately wanted that pistol for his pistol collection. Um, and during the interrogation that was going on, this guy wouldn't tell us where his pistol was, whether he had one or not. To this day, I still don't know. But as I was putting in a drip and putting on bandages and so on, out of utter frustration, really, my unit commander shot him through the head in, in cold blood right there in front of me. The stress that people were under was enormous. The guys that were with me were taking drugs because we were medics and we had access to drugs on a regular basis. The guys were trading drugs for food with the kitchen staff and we were drinking alcohol at an alarming rate. And during the Christmas uh, sort of New Year week, I think maybe 11 or, or 15 guys in our immediate camp committed suicide by shooting themselves with rifles and, and so on. The sense of sanity was just what was sane and what wasn't sane anymore. Um, and we went to go and see a psychiatrist up there and uh, his attitude was, you know, just get on with your job. It's, there's nothing wrong with you, 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 know, you can still fight, so carry on. Um, and there was no sense of understanding where we were coming from or, or how we were feeling. One evening we were driving down one of the tar roads and uh, drove into an ambush. I can still remember I was reading the book E.T. at the time, not expecting anything, and the next minute a rocket went through our engine and our Casper came to a halt in the middle of a sort of gunfight. And in that situation, you just take your, uh, your rifle and you shove it out the hole in the side of the Casper and you just shoot it. It doesn't matter which direction the person might be in. You just shoot at anything, uh, not even anything that moves, just pull the trigger and hope for the best. Um, and I just remember the, the noise, the, the flashes of light, the rockets flying over and under us and so on. It was just a very intense situation and one where it, it, it was as though the world had stopped and, and it, there was just this commotion going on. Once it had all sort of simmered down and finished, I realized that I'd only shot one shot because my rifle had jammed at that point. Um, and afterwards, sitting on, on top of the roof of the Casper, and there was one swap insurgent that was lying dead on, on the tar road. And I was so frustrated, so angry that somebody had tried to take my life. The fact that I tried to take his life didn't really dawn on me, but somebody had tried to kill me. And I took my rifle and I aimed it at his head and shot him in the head. And sort of the, as the corpse jumped on the ground, I kind of thought to myself, what have I done? Um, and later that night, um, I was, I was just ill and vomiting and had diarrhea and really just got a sense of what I had done. And everybody in the team around me just kind of laughed at me and said, ah, we all went through that, you know. It's just getting used to the thing, you know, you'll get used to it. And kind of almost saying, you're the abnormal one because you're reacting to what you did. But I was also depressed by another thing. I did not know would I cope up with life outside prison. I was still frightened. I wasn't sure as to whether my going out of prison was not another ploy by the security forces. In my mind that I would not be arrested once more, I would not be shot. And more than any other thing that would I get a job? What will happen to me? Will I be normal? Would I still have my old friends that I, I had before I left the country? And I need to say to you that I got married when I was in Robben Island. And as soon as I was released, I did not know that uh, prison and torture and the like would affect my, my, my sexual drives. So there I was, I could not just uh, engage in, in, in sexual intercourse the way uh, a normal person would. And that affected me a great deal. In many ways, I was alone. Spiritually or psychologically, I did not have any backing. I was alone, and in any way, I did not expect that somebody could help me. I just needed to help myself. When I came home, I was having a lot of nightmares, not that I can really remember them. Very specifically, the guy who got shot as my patient, I can remember having his face reoccur night after night after night in my memory for maybe a month or more. 
the nightmares my parents, I think, can remember a lot more of them than I can because they were having to deal with this and nobody had told them that I was going to be going through this. No, they kind of, and nobody had told me I was going through this. So we were all kind of on uncharted territory thinking that we were the only family in the world going through this kind of a situation. There was nothing out there to help us when we came home. There was not even any debriefing at the base camp before we left the army. It was a matter of go home and it's over. There was no structure in place, certainly not one that was advertised or that we knew about. And there was no acknowledgement from the military or from society to say, this is what we've been doing up there and this is what you can expect to happen to yourself. Um, as a result of that, it took me more than 10 years to start looking for help, um, to start trying to find professional help that could actually help me deal with what was happening inside of me. Subsequently, I've been to see a couple of the guys that were with me and many of them are still living within those nightmares.